Albert Einstein once said, I have no particular gift, I'm just passionately curious. Three centuries earlier, Descartes stated, I'm no smarter than others. Alexander Grothendieck, the great greatest mathematician of the 20th century, explained that his astonishing mathematical creativity is not the product of extraordinary gifts. Such capacities are certainly precious and worthy of desire for those who, like me, have not been blessed with them ever. When we hear those words from the most iconic geniuses of history, men who have radically changed the course of science and mathematics, it is difficult to believe them. It seems like they are unaware of their capacities, or worse, being falsely modest. And yet, if we consider them to be geniuses, why would they all be wrong about the nature of their mathematical intelligence? But if it was the other way around, we are the one that got it all wrong. Well, that's what we're going to explore today. Let's first look about what we know about mathematics. Since our earliest exposure to this topic in an educational setting, we have been taught three concepts that we have internalized to the point that they seem like absolute truth. Firstly, that mathematics is a tool of science, but inhumane, undesirable, cold, and unuseful on its own. If mathematics are just a tool of science, however, however why did mathematicians develop them for millionaires? Why they started being applied to sciences only a few centuries ago? Secondly, to be good at math, one needs to think logically. Not only is this anatomically impossible, but also profoundly incorrect, as we will later prove. Thirdly, we believe that some people are just naturally good at thinking logically, but the majority of us aren't, as if we're missing a math gene, and we're thus forever doomed to never be good at mathematics. By extension, we believe that geniuses like Einstein and Descartes have brains that are structurally different from ours. Now, this idea is deeply dangerous and it is outrageous that we believe it so naturally. To say that some people are naturally good at mathematics and others aren't, and that we can't do anything to change that, is ultimately similar to saying that some people are just made to work in cotton fields and others to run politics or that some people are predisposed to work in the kitchen and take care of the children, while others to work. But then, if an innate logic isn't the center of mathematics, what is? Einstein, Grothendieck, Descartes, the mathematician David Plessis, and so many others have repeated it again and again, intuition and imagination. In fact, Grothendieck even stated that the center, the soul, and the purpose of his work were his mental images. The crazy part is that we already have this imagination, and by extension, the same tools as some of history's well-known geniuses. Don't believe me? Let's look at a few examples created by David Blesses. So first off, imagine a perfectly round circle right in front of you. This may seem ridiculously easy, but it proves that not only are we capable of imagining abstract mathematical concepts that do not exist in the real world, nothing is per perfect round, but we can literally see them. You can make the circle bigger, smaller, move it in your head, etc. Now, let's think about the following question. Can a single straight line intersect a, cir a circle at three points? Try to visualize all the combinations of a line intersecting a circle. Almost intuitively, the majority of us would say no, obviously not. So not only are we capable of imagining abstract mathematical concepts, like lines and circles, but we can wonder about abstract questions and manipulate these objects in our head to answer them. If you dive into relativity, the greatest contribution to science of Einstein, its origins come from a mental image not much more complex than this one. Imagine one billion now. 
subtract one from it. Almost instantly, you would visualize 999,999,999. Perhaps not be able to express it directly, but at least to visualize the series of nine or something similar. This may not seem particularly hard. It seems obvious. Well, in ancient Rome, the word, the word billion did not exist. The only way to express it would be to say that it is the product of a thousand times a thousand times a thousand. Already, this would be hard for Romans to understand. But if you told them that you could take this number, subtract one from it, and almost instantly visualize the result, Romans would think that you're a genius with absurdly powerful capacities. <laughs> what is even more striking about this thought experiment is that we are using the decimal number system, our way of writing numbers, without even thinking about it, as if it was an extension of your body. You think you are seeing the number one billion or the series of nine, but you aren't. You are deciphering a complex and abstract mathematical notation. And you do that intuitively, instantly. If this seems dumb and irrelevant, it is precisely because you genuinely comprehend it. This is imagination in math. Thinking intuitively, being able to invoke a subject as if it was, as if it was right in front of you. <coughs> as Felicis explored, it may seem relevant or even intimidating that the key to mathematics is just everyday intuition and not a special mathematical gene. I mean, it's so common that we want to thread away, and yet it is so powerful, as we'll now look at. So many of you have heard about the mathematician Gauss adding all the numbers from 1 to 100 when he was 7. So let's look at this experiment. How to add all the numbers from 1 to 100. The majority of us, myself included, we take out a piece of paper and a pen and literally start adding the numbers one after the other. Unfortunately, we have fallen into the trap of language. We believe that naming things is enough to understand them. We have lost our useful familiarity with numbers. To get out of this trap, we need to go back to using our imagination. Imagine all the numbers from 1 to 100 right in front of you, perhaps in this manner. Now, that's one step, but we're still using mathematical symbols to designate a mathematical object instead of seeing it. We need to go beyond our way of writing numbers. There are several ways to do that, but you could, for instance, imagine each number as a column made of a corresponding amount of squares. If you were to put the columns next to one another, you would get something like this. Now, of course, that's just a fake representation. The actual image should be 100 rows long, as there are 100 numbers, not just 18. It does, however, allow us to visualize the numbers. And what does it look like? A triangle, which means that we can use the area formula, length times width divided by 2, to find the sum. 100 times 100 divided by 2 is 5,000. The answer is 5,050. Try to find, to find what we did wrong. Well, we've forgotten how to have squares on top, which means that we need to add 100 divided by 2, 50. So our sum is 5,050. Or instead of using um, geometry, you could use probability. Imagine you're at Ellen's show, and she has put 100 envelopes in a box, each containing a certain amount of money from one to $100. The first one contains one dollar, the second one two, etc. You pick an envelope at random. How much, on average, are you expecting to get? In other words, when you pick a random number from one to one hundred, how much is it in average? The majority of us will say 50. Our intuition is a bit wrong here, just by one percent. It is actually 50.5 as we're starting at one and not at zero. We multiply that by 100, we get 5,050. Now, of course, the actual sum of uh, this problem does not interest us. What is important about this thought experiment is that a seemingly tedious and difficult math question can be turned into a simple and obvious question using our imagination. Our intuition will sometimes be wrong, as we, as we saw, 
but it is precisely by paying attention to the gap between our intuition and logic that you can improve it, as our intuition is in constant evolution, if you wanted to. Now, these examples, due to time constraints, were quite simplistic. But they do clearly indicate that by imprisoning ourselves to use exclusively logic and methods that we have robotically learned, we are limiting so much of our potential. Let's take a moment to consider how radically this nature about mathematics changes our vision of the world. If mathematics are just movement in the head, they are ultimately a physical activity. Memorizing what your math teacher says is just like taking notes in a yoga class. It's impossible to advance in mathematics by just applying logical procedures thoughts. Like it is impossible to learn how to walk by memorizing all the physics formulas involved. This nature of math also explains why they are so hard. Imagine tying your laces. In one or two seconds, you have visualized the entire process. Now take out a pen and a paper and write a step-by-step -step guide on how to tie your laces to someone who has never done it before. Hard. Because mathematics are mostly made in the, hair, in the head, it is extremely hard to transcribe them on paper. Mathematicians have invented words and symbols to designate them, and our challenge is to fill them with an intuitive vision of what they represent. Moreover, if mathematics are ultimately imagination, and we can all imagine, as we have seen with the circle and the one billion, then the greatest challenge in mathematics is ultimately confronting our psychological barriers, our sentiment of inferiority. It is extremely hard to accept that we are not inferior in mathematics because we have failed this math test or this math class, and even more so, to dare to stop relying exclusively on logic. To conclude, Mathematics are the science of practical imagination, not the field of knowledge. Their product is clarity and comprehension, not a theorem. It is a human, alive concept. By allowing us to designate what we cannot see, by extending and reprogramming our perception, mathematics extend our vision and intuitive comprehension of the world that surrounds us. And that's the true purpose of mathematics. Of course, being able to combine logic and imagination and language is initially very hard and slow. But if we take the time and effort to observe mathematical objects patiently, we can comprehend them. When Einstein said that his abilities originated from being patiently curious or for God and take, for, for, from staying alone listening to things, intensely absorbed in a child's game, that's what they were talking about. Being good or bad at math isn't about a math gene or thinking logically. It comes down to allowing yourself to use, develop, and reprogram your mathematical intuition with everyday means, imagination, curiosity, and sincerity. Thanks.